So, uh, as I told you last week, I was asked by Victor to give you um, to be responsible for one session of this course from philosophical perspective, which is a small, a very short introduction for, uh, to the concept of rationality from the perspective of philosophy. So, I will do that in five parts. You, you saw the syllabus. So, I will first discuss with you what irrationality means. So, so we start with definition of irrational things, and I will present you a short history of irrationality. And then I will go to some history of the concept of reason, so from Plato, Aristotle to Kant and Max Weber. And then in the third session, I will discuss about Kant's practical reason and how this is related to the concept of law and economy. In the fourth part, I will talk to you a little bit about Max Weber because he has some interesting concept of rationality in context of modern society, and that's what we will discuss um, in the last part of the course. Did someone have time to read this text by Peter Koller, Ethik und Ökonomik? Nobody. That's fine. Then I will uh, also explain that text, and I will introduce some basic thought of this text, and then we have a bit of time to discuss until past four. So let's please let me do a very short brainstorming. If someone says that was that is irrational, or that person is, is irrational, or that action was irrational, what do you associate with the term? Describe it in other terms if someone is irrational. Senseless. Meaningless. Senseless? Yeah. Senseless, yeah. Meaningless. It's not thought through, so it's an idea that has not been, um, how do you call it, well, thought through in your head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's about, about, about thinking. And yeah. Think. Yeah. Any other ideas? Something that cannot be justified. Yeah, so just, that just that's, that's a good point, yeah. If something is reasonable, it has a good, good reason. Like any other? What do you associate with uh, the history of European philosophy? What was rational and what was irrational? What do you think? For example, some, some institutions or some, some... Which institutions do you think are believed to be irrational? I mean, if we're talking about the era of enlightenment, back then uh, there was this breakthrough that churches were yeah. being irrational, promoting religion. Right, religion was thought as part of irrationality of human being, and which, but which was overcome by some enlightened thinkers or some rational thinkers. We can of course question that, but that was the history. Right. Does someone studied mathematics? Um, I did not study mathematics, but if you're talking about the number five, then that yeah. is also irrational. Yeah, yeah. What, what that, was that irrationality in this context mean? Sorry, I'm not an expert, so I would just listen. Okay, that's that's interesting point. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah irrational, irrational. Something that, something that can't be divided, uh, uh, shown in a, uh, a ratio. Yes, like. yes, perfect. And that's the original meaning of irrationality. What do you think? Is can ethic be rational, or if we make normative, normative actions, how can we judge if this is rational or irrational? Um, well, it can be, actually. I mean, um, if you look at the categorical imperative, it's like um, irrational to try to do something which forfeits its purpose by doing it. Yeah. Good point, yeah. Ethics can be rational, too. Um, or the other perspective would be utilitarianism, and then we would ration the greatest happiness for the greater number. So that's yeah. exactly the counterpart of the categorical imperative. So that could be seen as rational that we do something that seen ethical by the most of the people and we reinforce yeah. it by to be institutionalized. Yeah, that's also a form of rational ethics. Can you think of any thinkers who thought ethics is something irrational? Or which ethical schools would say thinking about ethics as such is irrational? Uh, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche, yes, yes, yes. Uh, someone wrote in the chat. Mark, thank you. Yeah, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, that's a school of thought which say, well, it's about willpower or it's about power relation and it's not about rational reasoning of what we do, uh, if it's correct or not. 
or you can think of decisionism, which says the, our action is just um, a set of decisions, arbitrary decisions, and someone who decides is not bound to any universal law. Karl Schmitt, for example, the sovereign who, who decides over exceptional state, and he's not bound to any ethical or any even legal imperative. Thank you so much for brainstorming. Now you can uh, relax a bit. I will tell you a history of irrationality, the first point. Um, well, what I noted, and I referred to that, that book, Antithetik Neuzeitliche Vernunft, Ernst Feil, who wrote a history of rationality and irrationality. Uh, he says his point is irrational is something that comes from mathematics. And only in, in 20th century it, it became a counterpoint of rational. So we, we talk about the antinomy of rational and irrational. And he says that's actually a very modern phenomenon. And he, um, you know, maybe the debate between uh, Karl Popper and Jürgen Habermas. So Karl Popper was a critical rationalist who said, I am a rationalist, but I don't have a rational reason to be a rationalist. That's how, what critical rationalism is about. And Habermas says, he himself considers as a rationalist, and he says it is irrational to say that there is no rational reason to be a rationalist. And then Popper says, well, by arguing like that, then Habermas is very irrational because he is irrationally bound to rationality. So this is an interesting constellation of two rationalists who say the other part is irrational. So it's a polemical um, concept to say that rationality is something good, and someone who doesn't share my concept of rationality is, as such, irrational. But the original term in, in, in Greek, it means a logos, no logos, no, log no logical. And it means that um, the, the number pi, which cannot be expressed as the relationship between two numbers. And the Latin translation of that relationship is the ra ratio, and if something is not in a ratio, then it is irrational, irrational. For Greeks, it was important that this irrationality doesn't mean that you don't know the number. It was not something very mysterious. It's not something you, you, you can't think of. It's just a number which cannot be expressed in a certain language, in a mathematical language of, of ratio. But you know, you know the number. This is pi. Pi is clearly defined. And in this sense, the philosophers use the term of irrationality throughout the history. Leibniz, and so if you are in really interested in irrationality, you, you should read this book. Leibniz and all the thinkers. Also Schelling of uh, German idealism. He says, um, God is in a sense irrational, but not because God himself is something irrational but we don't have enough time to explicate the concept of God. God is is infinite entity. And that relation between uh, finite things and infinite God makes God appear as, as irrational. That's the thought of, of Schelling. So it, it doesn't mean that God himself was thought irrational. That's a very important point. And until 1900, Irrationality is used only in that sense, so as, as in, uh, is derived from a mathematic concept of ratio. And can you express something in terms of ratio between two numbers? And in 1900, things changes, and uh, the new Kantian uh, philosopher Heinrich Rickert, well, he said, well, anything is irrational which doesn't come from my ratio. So anything you find in the reality and the reality as such is structured in such irrational way so that we can control it rationally and everything we can do is to think about that reality and conceptualize with rational terms so we so our human mind tries to rationalize irrational things we find in the world and that's quite new concept it, it comes up with with Henrik and a new Kantian philosophy and for, for him, which, which will be very interesting also for, for Max Weber, for him, only our concept and our reason can be rational 
and anything else is irrational. So not only what we define empirically in the world, but also irrational are, for example, art. It's something we find empirically. We can talk about it with our concept of, ra of, of, of rationality, but art as such is something irrational. And the same uh, applies for history, we say. History as such is something very irrational. We try to understand it by a rational concept of our mind, but history as such is something irrational. And then its conclusion is also that values are irrational things. So we can, we can rationally conceptualize our value preferences, but values as such are something irrational outside of our, our reason. And this understanding of value, the neutrality of science, this is something which will be relevant also for, for Max Weber later. And we will also discuss about the uh, philosophy of ec economics. So can values or value preferences be, be, be rational as such, or as in, can, be, can they be, be an irrational expression of, of, of something we, we can't control? And the last point, well, Karl Popper, I already argued, if you, if, you, if you don't derive the concept of irrationality from mathematics as a ratio, but in that new Kantian terminology, then at the end for Karl Popper, the reason be itself becomes kind of irrational. So there is no good reason to be a rationalist. He says, I am a rationalist, but well, there is no, no reasonable reason uh, to decide or to choose uh, rationalism as a, as a philosophy. So, and, and you can see the, how the, the, this, this term changed historically so much. So, uh, irrationality doesn't doesn't mean in Greek term al logos doesn't mean that this this number pi is something very mysterious or something something of of, of opaque something arbitrary decision but in 20th century we have this this term of of irrational and this also Ernst Feil says we, sh we shouldn't talk about irrationality irrationality at all maybe that's a bit exaggerated but if we talk about irrationality as a philosopher we need to be aware of that history of concept so that was my first point now we we know what irrationality is now let's come to rationality. What does it mean? We, we all know the concept of reason. And let's go back to of also to ancient Greek philosophers. They they uh, they had the concept of noein thinking noein, and they they distinguish two kind of, of of thinking, which is the first first one is an intuitive way of thinking, of intuitive knowledge. Of, of the of the uh, of the holistic uh, understanding of the world think of plato and his idea of the good if you know this then you will know the ultimate truth and your capacity to do to to to, to know it is called nous in german geist in latin it's intellectus news is intellectus and this is intuitive things for the holistic understanding of the world and there's another capacity of human rationality which is dia noia it also comes from noe in thinking and dia is through so thinking step by step is to the meaning of dia noia and the latin translation is ratio these are two different kind of two different faculty of the reason the one is more intuitive and the, the other is discursive way of getting to the truth and for both aristotle and plato nous the geist the intellectus this is the highest knowledge and in christian philosophy this is the faculty with which you can you can know also god and for dianoia of ratio this is Cal with calculating with empirical things. This is a lower faculty of your, your reason. And uh, this changes. I mean, th these concepts are there, but th the priority of the, the philosopher said changes. Because in, in modern times, we don't think of God as the highest possible object of our knowledge, as 
antique philosophers Aristotle did and as the Middle Ages did in, in modernity we have understand a different understanding of nature in Francis Bacon for example as something we can change by our technical knowledge and this was not the case before in, in Christian thought it was the God's creation and this was it had its, 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 its own logics but for Francis Bacon nature is something we we can we can understand but also we don't study the nature in order to know God's intentions but we, we study the nature in order to change the nature and create new things by new technology and that's very different understanding of nature and in this context of course that kind of, of rational thinking becomes more more important than nous intellectus which is only theoretical knowledge of the whole world and the reason why we are here and the nature of God and so on and that kind of rationality is becomes very relevant for um, the philosophers you, you also quoted, like John Stuart Mill and, and, and utilitarianism, and in context modern economics and modern sociology of Max Weber, they don't think of that. So they would they would say if we if we talk about God and God's attribute and God's creation, then they will think we are irrational people actually. Rational is only something which is based on empirical positivist understanding of nature and what we can do with the nature in a practical sense and to make them predictable and we calculate with the things. So that was the second point. So what you have to know is this distinction between nous and dianoia, and that this distinction was really important in antiquity and in the Middle Ages and how this priority of the philosophers changed in the modernity because of a, a different understanding of nature. That was my second point. Now we come to a third point, which is Immanuel Kant. <laughs> uh, you already mentioned a categorical imperative, which is an imperative of, of, of reason. <laughs> well, the point of Kant is that our theoretical reason has some limits. So if we talk about can't already know it. If you talk about God, then we, we can't come to a conclusion, to a final conclusion, because God itself, this is, it seems for us a very contradictory concept. So we can't talk rationally about God, we can't talk rationally about, about freedom and these metaphysical concepts, but he says there is one point where, where we get aware of the concept of reason in a very intuitive sense and he says this is in the in the in the area of, of ethics in the morals so he says fragt ihn aber ob wenn sein fürst in unter androhung derselben unverzögerten todesstrafe zumutete ein falsches zeugnis wieder einen ehrlichen mann den er gerne unter scheinbaren vorwänden verderben möchte abzulegen ob er da so groß auch seine liebe zum leben sein mag sie wohl zu überwinden für möglich halte ob er es tun würde oder nicht, wird er vielleicht sich nicht getrauen zu versichern, dass es ihm möglich sein muss, er ohne Bedenken einräumen. Er urteilet also, dass, dass er etwas kann, darum, weil er sich bewusst ist, dass er es soll und erkennt in sich die Freiheit, die ihm sonst ohne das moralische Gesetz unbekannt geblieben wäre. That's a quotation from Critic of Practical Reason. Uh, in, in English, uh, I don't have the translation, but he said, well, there is a man who a, a king comes to him and say you should lie about another person and if you don't do it you will, you get killed and Kant says well this person they he uh, he knows that he shouldn't do it and this is an uh, intuitive his his moral intuition and this is the point where the practical reason becomes aware or he he gets awareness of some something which is intuitive and it, it rationally intuitive and that's an example where Kant says, this is factum der Vernunft. It's a fact of reason. So he says, in this situation, if you have that kind of moral intuition, then you, you experience that, that the reason is real. Reason is a fact for you. So I hope you, you understand uh, his point. So it's not about, about reasoning, 
about some theoretical things. He's saying, he, but Kant says there are some points in your life where you, you get aware of, of something unconditional. And this is the fact of the reason. And then he says, and you know all the categorical imperatives, so you should act according to a, to a subjective principle which is compatible with universal law. And he says, anyone who has this capacity of being aware of fact of factum de fanum, fact of reason, and who, who, is, who is able to, to act morally, he should be treated as something which has dignity. And what fascinates me in, in Kant is that in moral philosophy he, he says so, so nice things like that. So you, sh so you shouldn't lie, you should risk your life if, if, if you are threatened by death, you shouldn't do wrong things, you should treat any other person with dignity, and that's, that's, that sounds all nice, but the interesting thing in Kant, and that's why I tell you about Kant, is that he has also a philosophy of law, and it is totally different. And if you, are, if you can speak German, I would recommend you this book, uh, Nicht Ideale Normativität, by Christoph Horn. It's a completely new reading of Kant's philosophy of law, and where he says, actually, Kant is realist. So he says, Kant's ethics is something, is, is an ideal theory he developed. But for the reality in which we live, he developed his philosophy of law. And both don't have much to do. Because in philosophy of law, he says, well, someone who, who doesn't obey to the legal order of the country must be killed. That's also what Kant says. He says we, treat, we, we need to treat human beings as, as, uh, as people who have human dignity. But at the same time, if you are against the legal order, then you must be killed. And at the end, he says, well, the, and, and in, in Christoph Horn's reading of, of philosophy of law, actually, he says, well, the only thing the individual should do in a modern nation, nation st state, according to Kant, is to obey the law of that country, not more. You shouldn't obey the categorical imperative, because that is much too much high demand, and it may be also subversive for a political order. And for Kant, it's important that uh, that we are not in the state of nature. So we need nation state, we need legal order, and we need uh, coercion so that we can protect private property and so on. So he says, in order to maintain that system, the only thing in each individual should do is to obey the positive law of the state. And at the end, Kant says, well, we can hope that this positive law of the state will converge with the moral imperative in the future. That was his hope. He said, when we get more, uh, more civilized, then at the end, maybe we reach that stadium. But by now, there are two different things. And at the, at the one side, there is a very, very high ethical demands for individuals and categorical imperatives. But in reality, we can't do it. So just obey the law of the state. And don't ask if the law is just or not. Just do it. And then hope for a better future. That's the it's dark side of, of Immanuel Kant, which is not so known, because nobody reads philosophy of law. But, I, but for me, what makes me really interesting is, again here, uh, the relationship between concept of reason and how these demands of the reason are uh, become so relative in the reality. In the second reading of, of, of Kant's uh, uh, in philosophy of law, you can connect him with thinkers like Max Weber or even with Niklas Luhmann, maybe, uh, that kind. And you can combine Kant perfectly with a, a capitalistic order also. Whereas in the, in the ethical reading of Kant, we need to ask if any action is just and if we treat any other individual as someone who has human dignity. So this is very ambivalent concept of reason in Kant, which I find really interesting. And that's also, actually, it's kind of discourse we, we do nowadays, too. So how these ethical imperatives are related to our political reality. That was my third point, this ambivalence in Immanuel Kant. I still have time. And my fourth point, I will come to Max Weber, who fascinates me a bit because he has a very differentiated view on, on rationality. Some thinkers like Horkheimer say, well, 
Weber reduced the concept of practical reason to instrumental rationality, and that led to Holocaust. And that's a bullshit. That's not reading of of Max Weber. That's a, an ideological reading of, of of rationality. But in Max Weber, you find very differentiated um, view on rationality. So um, his starting point is that our Western culture <coughs> is is very special in, in global context because we have rationalized culture we have a culture which 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 is based on rationalization of irrational things think of of Rickard's epistemology so our rationality is able to rationalize things which we find in the reality and which are per se irrational but by our rationality we can conceptualize and we can rationalize it step by step and Weber said that's a very specific Western phenomenon. We can discuss whether it's correct or not, but that was his position, and that is starting point of, of his investigation. He says, well, his starting point is um, action of, of individuals, and he says that there are two possibilities to act rationally. And the one is uh, what, he, what he calls Zweckrationalität, so rationality of the, of the means, and the other thing is Wertrationalität, rationality of values. In, in rationality of means, the goals are set by someone. And you just think which means are necessary to reach this goal. And the, and the other, value rationality, I mean, it's a rationality of setting the goals. So, for example, you want to... And Weber says, for example, Kant was a value rationalist, because he says there is this unconditioned uh, moral imperative is a value. So, so it's not something we need to to achieve some uh, different goals, but it's it's a value, an, an intrinsic value in itself. The same applies for him. Ethics, ethics is also for him a value rationality. The same also, religious. So if you want to uh, to to become a religious person, this is this is not something you do in order to to reach some goals. So it's a value rationality and other things like uh, in German he says reine Gesinnung, so uh, pure thought, which is uh, normally Kant. Schönheit, aesthetics is also value. Absolute Güte, uh, good absolute goodness is a term from theology, or absolute Pflichtmäßigkeit, the absolute obligation. It's also Kantian ethic. These things are values. A very interesting thing in Weber is that he doesn't say the values are irrational. And it's a very important point, and this is often uh, misunderstood. He doesn't say those who, who are religious or who, who try to some, do some, some moral things, they are not irrational people, they are not stupid people. They have just a different concept of rationality, which is not less rational than the other. And he says, since we have these two competing conce concepts of rationality, the modernity is full of ambivalence and full of conflict between these two different uh, concepts of rationality. <coughs> and then um, he also talks about the, uh, the political orders. So maybe you know his, uh, his, uh, he was fascinating was fascinated about the German bureaucracy because he said that's the most rational uh, way to organize a state which is totally impersonal and um, so you can also apply this distinction between rationality of means and values to political orders in that sense he, he distinguishes between material and formal rationality especially in a legal system so it's about so I told you that in, in, in Weber, the Western culture is about rationalization. So also the law is something which was rationalized step by step. Material rationality means you tried in a political order, there are some ethical considerations which need to be implemented. So value rationality, you want to do something with ethics or with religious beliefs. And formal rationality means it's it's an on, on an abstract level, it's formal rationality, it's independent from individuals, 
so independent from who judges you, independent of who you are, independent of your gender, of your nationality, of your age, and so in, in principle, of course, there are. I know that there is inequality, but in principle, the formal rationality strives for that level of abstraction which we, in, where we don't care about these material considerations or substantive consideration of how one, how do we want to live or how what would be the, the right belief or religion or something. And my point was, for example, in Islamic law, he says this is materially rational because the Islamic scholars try to establish an ethical order which is uh, in accordance with their holy scripture. And the important point, Max Weber doesn't say the Islamic law scholars are irrational people. He doesn't say they are stupid people. He just say they have a different kind of rationality. And in itself, it's consistent because they believe that God had spoken to them. So why not establish that kind of order? It's a different kind of rationality. So it's a material rationality and our modern society, modern law, modern capitalism, and so they are all based on the concept of formal rationality where we don't care about the, the individual quality or about your, your personal thoughts or personal qualities. And that makes a system also uh, predictable and, uh, and that makes possible that we have capitalism and so on and so on. So that's, that's this history of, of modernity in, in Max Weber. And also here in Max Weber we find a very interesting ambivalence. I give you two, two examples how these two different kind of, of rationalities uh, are in conflict. So first one, he says in economy, <coughs> capitalism means formal rationality, which is abstract. Capitalism is not the value in itself. It, it, it just tries to make economical things predictable, really calculated things. So in that sense, he says it's a formal rational system. But in, in, in order to establish this formal rational system of capitalism, he says we need to exploit the workers, which is a material value, which is an ethical, it's a moral consideration, which is necessary. And they may be in conflict. So someone could say, well, we want to have a formal rational system of capitalism, but we also want to have materially rational consideration on ethics if it's good to exploit the workers or not. So there are two different kind of rationality in conflict. And the second example he gives is in law, formal rationality means equality for all because it's an abstract formal system of law. And he says, if we have that system where everyone has the same freedom, then one, the ones are more suc uh, successful and the others are not successful. So the one gets richer and the other gets poorer. And then there comes to a power imbalance and this power imbalance will violate the principle of justice which is principle of material rationality. Justice is a value. So by establishing a formal rational order of, of modern law, we create a problem for those who, who think in, in materially rational terms, who strive for justice in a society. And it's very difficult to reconcile these two positions because both positions are in their own rational. It's not the case that the capitalists are, are bad people who are irrational and now we come with morals. It's not, it's not so easy, right? There are two different kind of rationality who comes in conflict in, 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 in modern society. And I think Max Weber saw that, that quite well, this ambivalence of, of modernity as something where, as a, as a forum where two different kind of rationalities are in, in, in permanent conflict. And that's what we will also talk about um, ethics of finance market and capital market. We have many different kind of rationalities coming in, in conflict to each other. And we don't, we don't have the super principle which can judge over each, how we can reconcile this conflict. So that makes it so, so interesting. Well, <coughs> that was Weber. Now I come to the last point, which is this text I recommended to you for, for those who, who speak German. Um, 
because he is a legal philosopher, and he is uh, um, he comes from from Kantian and tradition. He refers to Habermas, and I will also recommend you to read this because this is how you should write a good academic philosophical text in a, such an easy language, so comprehensible, but with with substance. This is really really good and easy read. Um, so what is ethics at all? So he says, well, in modern ethics, we don't talk about good life as Aristotle did. Aristotle uh, asked the question how we can be become happy. He says by doing moral things, we can become happy. And that's the ultimate goal of human being. And that's not the question we ask in philosophy anymore in modernity. Um, and Habermas, for example, he says he did the moral questions they are a question of justice in the political philosophy, and that's something for philosophers. But how we should live a good life, this is a question for, a, a problem for literature, for art, for music, and so and these things. And this is not something where philosophers should disturb. And I personally agree. Um, you may disagree, but that this is the mainstream distinction of ethics of justice and how is good life conducted in a broader sense? We have the, 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 uh, the rational concept of homo economicus, and you, you all know what, what it is. It's an, an economic model, and there are people who try to, to apply this concept also to ethics. They say, if everyone acts rational in terms of, of homo economicus, then the world will be a moral place. And he says, this transition is problematic uh, because economy asks how the, the goods are allocated according to market uh, principle and they cannot ask whether the, the status quo distribution is normatively good or not. This is not the question of homo economicus. We just ask the preferences, we just analyze the preference and how we can allocate the goods. And he says Eticians must do uh, one step before, which is questioning if the actual distribution of goods is something just or not. And that makes him um, separate these two spheres, ethics and economy, and he suggests uh, five different uh, um, standpoints, which we will discuss now. The first point is separation. Uh, you know the system theory of Niklas Luhmann, he says there are two totally distinct systems. One is ethics, it's about good, about morally good, and economy, it's about efficiency. And they don't have nothing to do with each other and they shouldn't intervene to each other. Uh, the second position, which is reductionist position, being moral means doing efficient things in economical terms. And this is a little bit Hobbes. So if, if you have self-interest and you pursue it, then you will have a uh, Leviathan, this nation state, and then it will be better than before. So pursuing self-interest is already a kind of ethics. That would be a reductionist, we say. The third point is harmonization. He says efficiency criteria of economy and justice criteria of ethics, they converge in the economical market. So anything which is allocated efficiently in economical terms is just, in also in moral terms. And the fourth possible position is trade-off. He says trade-off. He says, well, there are two different rationalities. We need to accept it. And then we discuss uh, which we prioritize. And he says, this is problematic position. Trade-off would also mean that we should discuss whether slavery is an efficient uh, way of, of labor so he says well, it's not actually so if we if we do ethics in serious manner then we can't do a trade off of economic efficiency and, and ethics because the ethics has in some points um, a priority over efficiency and the last point he says this is his point these there are two different systems but they complement each other and they complement each other, but there must be a priority of moral consideration over economic when they do not converge. 
which doesn't help us at all because it's so so abstract and and it's it's quite easy to say that, that let let's develop a, a complementary system of of ethics and economy. This is quite easy to say, but it's really difficult to to develop it into depth because what does it mean exactly? But now you have these five possible positions, and you are kindly invited to to keep that in mind while you listen to Victor's lectures about finance market in the next six or seven sessions, because he will also talk about many rational decisions, but that rationality is only a very small part of the concept of, of reason in the, in the history of philosophy. And in a third part, if you give presentation about ethics of finance market, then you have to keep in mind that the whole philosophical discourse on rationality in, in your mind, because otherwise you have, you're not up to date. So you have to, you have to keep this distinction in mind if you talk about ethics and finance market. So that was very, very short introduction in, in rationality in philosophy. Thank you.